Um, I think a lot of people at university wait until the very last minute to think, what am I going to do? Was for me, the minute I came back in the third year, I thought this is going to fly by. You can teach somebody sales skills, you can teach somebody entrepreneurial skills. I do believe the skills required to be successful in business, you are either have them or you don't. I think I learned a very important lesson, I think, at the age of 18, that going to work is the biggest part of your life. It's what, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Claire Young dubbed the Rottweiler by Alan Sugar as she reached the finals of The Apprentice in the fourth season. Now you might sit there and watch some of the more recent episodes of The Apprentice and build a picture in your head of how somebody from that show moves on to run their own business. But let me tell you, Claire Young is tenacious, driven, and she's built up two businesses since leaving the show and spends a considerable amount of time as well supporting young people, particularly disadvantaged and particularly girls, supporting girls in building up their careers, looking at entrepreneurialism. This is somebody who doesn't just run her own business, but also gives a lot back after finishing that show, a great career to where she is today. This is her story. My name's Richard Osborne. This is Drive, the small business podcast from UKBF. Hello, Claire. Hi. Good to see you. It's, it's been so long since we first met back in, it must have been, sort of saying earlier, 10, 11, 12 years ago. I think I, when I took part in The Apprentice in 2008, so it would have been the back end of 2008 or 2009, yeah. and then linked ever since. Yeah. Time flies I, when you have I think it was an event in Kettering. You was a speaker at one of those events there, and uh, it would have been off that. But um, a lot's been going on for you yes. since then. Yeah. Um, so what I'd uh, like to do is sort of picture sort of the, your start, your, your start in life, effectively. And you was born in Johannesburg. Uh, well, yeah. So, uh, but then, am I right? And sort of grew up in Bristol. Didn't grow up in Bristol. So I was no. born in. We went to my mum went to South Africa. Yeah. at the time with my father's job and he was involved in these things called computers which nobody <laughs> knew about so they lived in South Africa for I think nearly 15 years where me and my brother were born yeah. and then they went to Canada again with computers wow. we were meant to go to America and at the last moment we came to we went to go to New Jersey and we went to Wakefield in West Yorkshire slightly different I, was gonna say, I see the link there so I was born I was brought up in Yorkshire so from my accent, lots of people assume I'm born and bred a northerner, which I suppose yeah. I am. Um, but I do think having a background where you've parents, well, it's your home life, parents who were willing to take a risk and do something completely new is definitely linked to how I am as a person today. Yeah. See, with that travelling uh, at that young age then, as you just say, you talk about sort of taking a risk. The um, It's... How did that sort of impact? Was you aware it was happening at the time whilst you was that young age? I think so, because we're, now when I meet people who have, we're all different, there's different courses for different horses, but when I meet people who have never left their, left their postcode, so to speak, particularly when I'm working with young yeah. people who don't think past a postcode despite being on this you know, internet for like 10 yeah. hours a day, this global gateway, I probably didn't realise at the time, but I saw that we moved and we took risks and we travelled and I was always flexible and I think that's definitely something which I think having, well, having a business, that's, I think, one of the main yeah. things. You've got to have the courage to take a risk on the unknown. Yeah, absolutely. And the at that point, so you're, you're in Yorkshire, Wakefield, yeah. um, picking up the accent, with looking at, we'll come to what you're doing now and where you are in sort of your business career at the moment, but you went and studied equine um, in university. Yeah. So what was your original aspirations? So I went to a very traditional school and I think, I would like to think <clears> that careers guidance has now changed 20 years down the line, but literally my careers guidance lasted of about 10 seconds with a woman who was about 90 who I don't think had left school ever. I had no world experience outside of school. She looked at my grades. I was really good at science. I was a straight-A student. I had to work really hard for my grades. 
And she said, well, you can go off and do medicine. And I actually did a year of medicine before I changed my degree. I think I learned a very important lesson, I think, at the age of 18, that going to work is the biggest part of your life is, what, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And I had this niggle, I had this doubt that I could have done a five-year medical degree. I like the academia, I like studying. Did I want to get at that point? I was talking, I've always spoken a lot to people and asked questions and talking to the doctors I was meeting, would you work, do, would you do it all again? And they're like, no. Do you enjoy working for the NHS? No. Thinking, do I want to, I think as a doctor, you've got to dedicate your life to it. So yeah. I dropped out, black sheep, I dropped out of a medical degree. And I, rem I went to a careers office in Wakefield, which I think is still there today. And I said, I'm academic and my main passion is horses. And they found me, of course, at Bristol University. I'd never really heard of Bristol. I think a lot of northerners, we don't tend to leave the north of England. And I had to look at the map and I thought, oh, it's 200 miles away. I might not like it. I might not know anybody. I didn't know anybody. Um, but I really wanted to go and study horses, something I was passionate about to quite a high level, but made the decision at the end of my degree that anybody in the equine world like yourself, who's got you know a family, your children are involved with horses, it is a bottomless pit of money. Yeah. And I decided to earn my that money. That goes the wrong direction. Yeah. yeah. You're just you're pouring, it, pouring it into a hole. So I think at the age of 21, I thought, where do I want to be by, where I'm, by the time I'm 30, because at that point it felt really old, even though 30 is not old <laughs> at all. And um, I started applying for jobs. Bottom line, I wanted to earn some money. That was my motivation. Yeah. So you literally, the, 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 come the end of that, the industry to work in, when you're saying you're applying for jobs, it didn't matter what the industry was at that point when you were applying. Is that how you was feeling at that time? I, I felt that I was, maybe it's because I've always worked. As a, like Being young, I had to um, work at home to get my pocket money. Any part-time job, my dad would say, go and get your money and I'll double it. If, you know, it, we were always encouraged to work. And it was always made very clear that things were just not going to be given to me on a plate. So... I think a lot of people at university wait until the very last minute to think, what am I going to do? Was For me, the minute I came back in the third year, I thought, this is going to fly by. I'm not going to go live with my parents back in Wakefield. I need a job. I need some money. Um, and I went off to all the careers fairs, you know, when they come to university yeah. and they want all these bright, fresh, energetic, young brains. And I literally went and I was like a sponge. I just went and listened and I thought, well, that sounds a good company. It's like Mars, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Banks. And I didn't apply for one job. I applied for 83 jobs because I really yeah. wanted a job. I needed a job. Yeah. So, we, picking up on what you was just saying about your parents, though, that sounds like amazing. Like for, to, to instill such a great work ethic and direction into sort of the young put into a child the sort of earning your pocket money what you earn i'll double that kind yeah. of thing uh was you aware at the time of sort of how valuable that is and how do you reflect back on that i was i sort of i knew about the value of money because my mum my mum's very smart she taught me how yeah. to use an iron and she used to pay me to do ironing so the more <laughs> ironing i did i like remember i remember starting off with pillowcases i got 50p then i graduated to tea towels pillowcases then my dad's shirts because he works away so I used to do all my dad's shirts and it was just it, I, it's just simple for me the harder you work it's basic physics what you put in is what you're going to get out yeah. it's like in a business we all know that if you're starting a business probably the first two years are going to be horrific but the first once you put in you will get that out further down the line yeah and that's put you in good stead now I, do, yeah. I presume you carry that through into your own daughter as well definitely yeah. i think that's probably i think the tendency when you are able to you want to give a lot but you've got to hold the reins on it so to speak because yeah. she's yeah they've got, yeah got, got you to want to be able to provide and you want them to have what they want but at the same time it's just holding that bit back so they learn the value of money as you say it's the work and, ethic yeah. and it's the resilience it's just for me it's the work ethic i saw both my parents working really hard just just not for yeah. me that was normal 
And then when I've gone out into schools and I've seen families where people don't work and they don't have those role models, it was something I just took completely for granted that you get up, you have a purpose, you go to work, yeah. and then you start doing it the day after day after. Yeah, so that was normal to me. But I realise now it probably wasn't that normal. No, no. It's not, well, we both uh, do a lot in education between us mm. and we see it, um, you know, I see it a lot and you've just mentioned you see it. It, it isn't as normal as it would be good to be. Yeah, and I think yeah. something which I don't want to go off on a tangent, but something which I think we all probably learned in lockdown that as mammals, we all need a purpose, whether the purpose is clearing out a cupboard, going for a walk, doing your job. Yeah. People, particularly young people, are much better when they are achieving and doing. And I do often think when a lot of them are sort of going off the rails, it's because they haven't got a purpose, they are not haven't yeah. got anything to do. Yeah, so true, so mm. true. So you applied for 83 jobs. Yes. Uh, what did you get? Got five offers. Yeah. But I genuinely thought I was going to get 83 <laughs> offers. So when the letter, I can remember the first letter <clears throat> came and I thought, oh, they're going to say they want me because I was a straight A student. Yeah. I've done loads of work experience. I've got into medical school. I've got bronze, silver, gold, Duke of Edinburgh. I was doing everything I could to get into university. So again, rejection and how people deal with rejection, it makes me more determined. So I always say to people, don't apply to go on The Apprentice if you, if you feel that you can't cope with rejection because every two minutes you might be making a phone call or you've just got to keep on and what's the worst that someone says? No, you just keep on trying and trying and trying. But again, it's that resilience and that was definitely drilled into me at home and by my uh, head teacher, the school I went to. So, so you took the rejection well then when they came through? Yeah, I yeah, just yeah. thought, oh, well. Uh, and what one did you just take? Keep applying. <laughs> I left, well, when I left uni with five job offers, I can remember a couple of my friends were like, you're so lucky. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you do become. You sort of, I do think to a certain extent you create your own luck. I went to work for a company called L'Oreal, the health and beauty giants yeah. on their graduate scheme. So a girl from Wakefield who didn't speak French went to work for with no business experience, no business GCSE, A level, economics, nothing. Went on to I think there were ten places, and you, it's very competitive to get get yeah. in the company. Um, and I loved it. Loved yeah. it. I'm a, a big believer. You need to do what you're interested in. Uh, and, and what was your role there? I was on the graduate scheme. So the idea is they rotate you around the business. Uh, they take bright graduates who they can sort of mould into the L'Oreal way. So they um, teach you about sales, marketing, logistics, operations. And I was taken off the scheme about, I was there for about three months and they said, you're really good. I remember them saying, you know what you're doing. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and um, I, put, I was put into a marketing job. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, it was really, really uh, it, in lots of ways, an amazing company to work for. Yeah. Other ways, it wasn't. Um, and I was headhunted to go work for Colgate, the toothpaste company. So I'd worked yeah. for a very quirky French Parisian personality to then go work for this American big fat cat where brand, I wouldn't say brand is secondary, but it's all about the PL, it's all about the money. So, how, how do you. <laughs> How do you go from that to marketing toothpaste, if I'm taking that literally? Um, well, they said that they were going to train <clears throat> me to an accountant standard in finance on sales. Right. So I felt like from a development point of view, I, don't, I was happy to do the jump from quite a safe environment at L'Oreal with yeah. a global career pathway and lots of things promised. But I could see that I didn't feel that the culture of L'Oreal, the pastoral care, that it was called the L'Oreal Flush. People just used to disappear. And the average retention there was about 18 months. And I just felt like I was part of a churn. Um, right. And I felt like I'd got out of L'Oreal what I wanted from a development point of view, not realising that. But I thought, mm, I've ticked that box. I know what I'm doing on brand and marketing. And then when I was approached, doubled my salary and went to Colgate. And they said they're going to train me in sales, etc. I thought, well, I'm sort of, climbing that ladder and building my skill set and did at that point in time did you have any idea of what sort of your where you wanted to go what your 
what direction of travel you was on, what the destination was? Not, um, I knew that I would probably be at Colgate for maybe three years, tick yeah. that box, and then I was, uh, an account I was managing was A.S. Watson, and A.S. Watson had just bought in the UK the retailer Superdrug, and we're yeah. building a team, and they approached me for uh, a senior buy role, and it actually was the first time I'd, I had a wobble, as I call yeah. it, I was just like, oh, I don't think I can do it, it's, it was big. It was like, like two hundred and fifty million pounds worth of revenue and a team, and and it was my dad actually. who said, "Of course you can. Yeah. Just go and do it." So that I did. I sort of left again a very safe Colgate Palmolive. It's the most amazing company to work for, particularly yeah. if you've got children. You get extra days holiday. They really love their staff, and equally, you love them. So everyone does a great job. Um, and then I went to S. Watson and just I just loved retail and loved being a buyer. Yeah. So by sort of age 27, I'd sort of climbed the career ladder very quickly. So then this point, because when you're getting to that age, you're, you're building a very sort of quick career at a very high level with very high budgets and, you, and people are obviously seeing something in you because mm. you're being headhunted. Did you have any thoughts or ideas or aspirations at that point in time that you wanted to run your own business? No. I can remember feeling, um, I always, I'm not challenged, not being difficult, but questioned processes like, why do you do it like that? Have you thought about doing it this way? Um, it's looking at things in a different situation and often saving money or doing things a little bit more creatively. Even though I don't think I'm a creative person because I can't dance, sing, draw, but I'm, I am very good at coming up with ideas. I did find it unbelievable that a business which was aimed at nearly probably 90% female consumers had a board of men. And it was men making decisions of which they, as much as you try, you're not a woman, you can't understand. I found that baffling. Um I felt that this like entrepreneurial itch, some people have it when, well, I had it at school. I used to sell yeah. things at school. I used to sell sweets at school. At university, yeah. I used to sell cigarettes, which I know you're not meant to, but... <coughs> if, if, where there's a, where there's a demand, there's a business. Yeah. So what Steve Jobs say, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. If you see your opportunity, <laughs> you just go for it. You just That's part of being an entrepreneur. I used to sell enough cigarettes within two days to give me enough money for a whole term. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and then I think it was watching programs. I mean, I watched The Apprentice, which at that time had been on TV for only two two years. This year, yeah. we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of The Apprentice. Make me feel old. So programs yeah. like Dragon's Den and The Apprentice were quite like new and revolutionary. Yeah. And I used to sit when it was on BBC Two, uh, when it was very different a lot more low-key than what, mm. what the sort of mega brand it is today. But Wednesday night at 9 o'clock, it was cult viewing. We all used to watch The Apprentice. Colleagues, everybody would talk about it, families. Yeah. And I can remember just thinking, I'm better than these people. I'm a big yeah. believer you put your money where your mouth is and if you're going to say it, you do it. And I applied and that was it. I never looked back. That was that, because to apply... You have a business idea. You're looking for investment. Yeah, from... well, at my time, in the olden <coughs> days, it was a job. Um, it was a job. So yeah. I wanted a job to go work. I wanted to go work for, I wanted to go work for Alan Sugar. Yeah. Really successful guy. I think he's funny. And I actually thought, am I good enough? I'm, can I get picked? Because yeah. thousands of people get selected. And I think as well in the corporate world, it's a bit boring. You're yeah. on a... You're on a hamster wheel, but at least on my wheel, I'm on my wheel every day, on my entrepreneurial wheel. I'm not on somebody else's wheel telling me what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you obviously, it's new. The Apprentice has only just been running, and it, it, it was cult viewing. It was huge. And you, you're looking at these people, and I think pretty much in every season, all the past 20 years, any time you're watching, thinking, why are they doing that? Why? <laughs> that's so odd. Why are you doing It's the... really hard. <clears throat> it, yeah. is, it is hard. It's so easy from an armchair to sort yeah. of sit and go, I did it. I was like, these people are useless. And you realise <laughs> with reality TV that 
you tune in weekly, not because of the task, but because of the personalities, yeah. whether you like them or you loathe them and the sort of energy or connection between them. It was, it did, it changed, it changed my life. It changed me. But every single day we filmed, we had, we laughed so much. The crew had to put the cam cameras down because we all just, they won a BAFTA for our series. <laughs> and I said to the producer, Mark Saban, I said, why do you think so? And he said, the minute we started editing your tape, he said, we had goosebumps on the back of our necks because you all just had this great chemistry between you. Yeah. We were having fun. Yeah. But nowadays, it's all so contrived. Everyone's, because people are, once it's been on TV on any format of a show, People know what to expect. They play up to stereotypes. They're not going to... Whereas we were just literally raw to reality TV. And I genuinely did that experience to see if I was good enough and to go work for Alan Sugar, not no. to be on TV and not to have thousands of followers on Twitter or whatever people's motive are nowadays. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, it would be amiss, remiss to not ask about sort of some of the challenges and bits you do and how they, you know, if you look at The Apprentice as an interview process, mm. which is how, at least in the earlier uh, seasons, I feel it was very much like that. Um, we were just generally chatting earlier before we started talking about like the fish market, for example. Yeah. So when you're looking at those sort of challenges and using that as an example, what is that telling Alan Sugar? <laughs> straight away seeing how you can work with people who you don't know so we started yeah. we were put into hotels individually at I don't know, the tea time got a phone call at three o'clock in the morning and by four o'clock in the morning i'm stood in a boardroom with individuals tv cameras we were set off on a challenge really simple let's you know somebody walked in here and said go and sell some fish we're normal people we haven't got cameras following us but when you've got very strong personalities and I realized quickly we'd all been recruited for recruited is that the right word um yeah I can yeah, see that again because we it's almost like a bit like not a pantomime but you've got characters so I was probably the feisty northerner you've got the eccentric one the shy one the techie geek the mummy of the group and we were I suppose we all but we all ultimately are very competitive probably egomaniacs um and when you put all of those people together in this big mixture of no sleep high pressure adrenaline it will see very quickly who can work in a team who can keep level-headed and that's one of the things with the apprentice it was on tv um the new series and it was just mayhem particularly with the the women you've got to remain really calm with the unknown. And that's what Alan Shug was looking for. And he's mm. looking for resilience. And also he's looking for all, who's been authentic. So yeah. it's very easy for people at the beginning, you know, they all give the little spiels that they're the best thing since sliced bread. And, but when it comes to it, people aren't their actions. So who puts the hands up and volunteers? Hardly anybody who's willing to just get stuck in and who, yeah, and who who's not full of bullshit? Yeah, because there's a lot of bullshit. The um, when you look at um, uh, when I was before today looking at what your friends would call you or how they would refer to you, some of the words like impatient, headstrong, straight talking. Alan <clears throat> uh, Sugar had a different word for you. Yeah, he called me a Rottweiler. <laughs> but when I remember very clearly that boardroom, I remember so much of it because it was so. They say in life we remember highly emotive situations. And I remember yeah. The Apprentice crystal clear. I remember that boardroom. And he said, Claire, this is what people say about you. And the forms which they're looking at in the boardroom are the application form which you give to the process. Yeah. And they are literally like this thick. So if somebody leaves that to the last minute and then thinks, oh, I'll just put any old rubbish down, that's what comes back to haunt them because it's then on right. TV and they get called out but and when sir alan i call him sir alan was saying you know claire you're impatient you're um straight talking you, you could have been describing alan sugar we are very very similar in our traits i like things straight to the point yeah i yeah i'm very straight talking and i'm yeah. pretty intolerant 
not yeah. children and animals, but of grown up human beings who should know better. I am. Yeah, uh, fair. And but that's um, a little akin to also being tenacious as well. Mm. Um, put you in good stead in building up your career. Yeah. Uh, in the early days prior to the apprentice, the uh, so Jacob said earlier. The one who should have won, the yeah. uh, became the runner-up. I was the biggest favourite <clears throat> to ever win the Apprentice at the bookies. Yeah. yeah, and I couldn't believe. Now I don't know what the ratings are on the Apprentice, but we'll see for this new series. Eleven million people watched the final of series four. It's massive. It was, yeah, it blows. The night before it came on TV, Sir Alan said to me, "You are not going to know what's hit your life," and I thought, "What does he know? He's quite old." <laughs> But obviously, he's, he's, a, he's a veteran in The Apprentice, and literally, it just your life just changes overnight. Yeah, and and how did it change? All of well, you know, I wasn't used to walking into shops and people know your name. People were shouting Rottweiler out of car windows. <laughs> um, one of I can remember the first episode. This man went, "You're just like my wife. She's really feisty." And I went, "Aren't you lucky?" <laughs> um, but people, everyone wanted to sort you because it was such a big TV program. Everyone had an opinion about it. But that's good. It's good for people to have opinions. We've almost become a society where you can't have an opinion in case you offend anybody. Um, we, as candidates, were we were told not to use social media, and that is one of the big... I feel very lucky for that. I felt that we were very protected, whereas now it's a different ball game. They no. are actively encouraged to have TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and yeah you've just I think you've almost got to switch off a little bit from it all. Why Why do you think you were actively recommend you know said not to use social media and and then also why do you think that's changed now? I think social media has become particularly for like under 20s 25s such an integral part of their life that to have to get the young people as a viewer and to engage with them, they've got to be on social media. I think that's yeah. that's what it comes down to. It's all ultimately a TV show. Their success is their ratings, and your ratings are people tuning in. And you've got to, if you don't speak or engage with under twenty fives, you're missing out of millions of people potentially yeah. watching um, watching the show. Yeah. Um. After coming from the show, the that's when you became self-employed, yeah. started your own business. Um, the was was the first business Elegant Venues. Was yeah. That one? So what? So, tell us about that. But when you leave The Apprentice, it's not a twelve-week process which you see on TV and you sit and watch one episode a week. We filmed our entire series in five weeks, so we had half a day with no cameras. So. You are working 20-hour days. You are burning on adrenaline. You're exhausted. So when we actually finished the process, I came out and um, I can remember saying to somebody, I burst into tears and said, I don't even know what I've just been through. I felt like somebody had literally opened my head, pulled out my brain, put it back in and said, off you go. It was like almost like being on life for five weeks on business steroids and working with um, some really talented people in different aspects, but also a couple of people had their own businesses and they were, in my opinion, very poor at what they did. And I thought, well, if they're doing it, I'm, I, I'd am i reached that point, that sort of in entrepreneurial twitch, I suppose, as I would call it. Some people do it later in life. Some people are born with it. And I thought, I definitely want to start my own business, but then you've got to... For lots of people, they know they want to do it, but you've got to come up with the idea, haven't you? Yeah. And I worked with a lady on a property business called Elegant Venues where we um, helped people who had an asset, so a country home or a stately home, and wanted to commercialise it and turn it into primarily a wedding venue. And I call that my guinea pig business. I think there's very few people who will make a success of their first business. I think programmes like The Apprentice and Dragon's Den, I hope they don't give the idea that like you wake up one morning, you go, right, today I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to make a coffee and I'm going to switch on my computer and I'm Alan Sugar. 
you know, business isn't like that. No. It is a long, it's a hard slog and having that resilience when days are absolutely rubbish and sort of picking yourself up again. But that business, I learned so much about what to do, what not to do. So when I had the idea for my business, I was like, I know what I'm doing. I do. You, you touched on it there, but that's a real concern I have in so many different aspects, right from how entrepreneurialism is taught uh, within higher education primarily and how it's glamorized on TV. Mm. Uh, it's almost like the difficult bits are just sort of brushed over or not even like given any attention. Yeah. And it is, um, there was, I think it was Tony Blair used a, an analogy of there's an entrepreneur in everyone. And like <clears throat> everybody can go and run their own business. It's easy. You yeah, just go yeah, online I, and just create disagree. a company that's yeah. done. I disagree with Tony Blair in that quote because I think places like, for example, Peter Jones Enterprise Academies, yeah. which are, are great, but there is almost this premise that if you go and study there for two years, that you're going to leave there and you're going to be Richard Branson and you're going to be, you know, having a limited company, a PLC. I think. It's like salespeople. You can teach somebody sales skills. You can teach somebody entrepreneurial skills. I do believe the skills required to be successful in business, you are either have them or you don't. That no. resilience, that Alan Sugar calling me a Rottweiler because I did five boardrooms, like most people did one or two. But I remember saying to him, you know, when business is great, it's good. But when it's bad, you want no. somebody like me who will, no matter what my day's been like, I will be there again the next morning with my cup of tea, ready to go. Yeah. He's like, I love it. It's great. <laughs> well, that's what you need. You need that drive and you need that passion and that resilience to, mm. if I always say to people, if running a business was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's not yeah. like somebody gives you a book and says, here you go, this is what you do. The best way is really to just get on and just get started. Yeah. That's the hardest thing, isn't it? Yeah. Just actually taking that, that first step. step. Mm. Yeah. So what uh, what happened to Elegant Venues? Is it still going now? Is it? Uh... No, so um, I left as a director and then I think ultimately, I don't know if she sold it or closed the business. I don't actually know what happened to the end of the business because she went on to do a different venture. But when um, I was involved in that business, I was being asked by schools via yeah. my website. So going back, what, 2008? It's a long time ago, you know, having oh. your own domain, clareyoung.co.uk, and your own website was quite new. But people could contact you through your website and lots of schools were like, could you come in and talk? Like, what what, what do you want me to talk about? Just come in and talk about your job and you, what you do. And that started what I call sort of like you get the buzz from why yeah. we all probably do our businesses. I remember doing my first talk in Blackpool and thinking, I got in the car, thought, oh, I've got the buzz, I really enjoyed that, and then you'll just do a bit more, a bit more, and before I knew it, I was doing so much, I was passing work on to other people, and then I spotted, light bulb moment, a gap in the market for lots of other speakers, so uh, Science Week, um, Black History Month, addiction, mental health, all these topics where schools needed speakers, and nobody was putting speakers under one brand in schools. So I did it. And create school speakers. Simple. Yeah. So something when, you know, being spending time with Alan Sugar, he's like, you, you don't have to be the brains of Britain to be an entrepreneur. You need a really good idea. You need to do it and you need to keep it simple. Yeah. So when people say to me, what do you do? I'm like, school speakers. And we put speakers into, well, primarily education, but we work with, as the business has evolved, we work with a lot of corporates, charity. We work with everybody, really. Yeah. And, and, What's that sort of business journey been like with school speakers? I I think, what what do they say with entrepreneurs? That um, happiness is the journey, not the destination. Yeah. So now I, my business is at a point where it's very comfortable. I love my business. I still love my business. Don't get me wrong, I have days where I do think, oh, you know, when... My product, I'm dealing with the humans who can get sick, who can be late, who can let me down. But overall, I feel very lucky that I've got a business which what is um, 13 years old, which I still really enjoy going yeah. to work. It's hard, though, the first couple of years of starting a business. And it's almost like the plane taking off, isn't it? When you're on the tarmac and you think, are we ever, 
and then as you start taking off, I mean, we're here now cruising. Nah. But I do love, and looking back on it, I love the startup bit of yeah. business. And um, and did you go into business in a partnership with school speakers initially? I did. I yeah. um, so I set set up the business with somebody who would be in the office, and I would be out sort of front facing the business. It's very interesting having a business partner who's now um, we sort of parted ways, and she, I mean, she's not involved in the business. I unless there was a reason to have a business partner, whether financially or skill set or contacts. I would never have another business partner again. Yeah. And I say to people, if they do have business partners, watch your exit agreement, paperwork, because when everything's all singing and all happy, but that piece of paper could save you a lot of pain down the line if things don't go according to plan. Yeah. Um, the fact you mentioned that, did you have that piece of paper? You No. 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 <laughs> Because I, I, no, because you think when you go, I suppose it's like when people go into marriage, they never think that they're going to be signing divorce papers one day because you do everything with goodwill and good intent. But now, if I went into business with anybody, any work I do, projects, I don't really do anything until that paperwork is returned to me. Yeah. You've got to have the paper trail. So how does, um, if you can ask, how do you deal with that situation then if the... I'm making an assumption here, the relationship's breaking down, presumably. Mm. Um, and you both own a stake in this business. You're in a partnership. Yeah. And that. How do you, and you don't have the piece of paper, what happens? And, well, in, that, in my case, I took control of the situation and put a proposal together to um, take the shares from her and, in exchange for, what, for a financial amount and take her out of the business. It's difficult, and yeah. I see so many cases where businesses haven't worked out in re or relationships have broken down, and you, you've got to have that exit agreement in place before you start a business. It's, it's something we see a hell of a lot of on UK business forums. So you have right. um, more, than, well, more than you'd like to. People will come along and pose a question saying the... Whether it's anything like a husband and wife business and they're getting divorced, oh, it can be anything from yeah. that to I went into, I'm in business with my brother. We've had those situations. And right. so even like close family to just friends. Families are different. <clears throat> yeah. I would never go into business with family or no, friends. No. Because ultimately, it's like if you loan somebody money, you either yeah. accept that you either lose that money potentially or you lose that friend. Yeah. You either lose that family. I do know a lot of people who don't speak as family members over businesses and money. No. No, I wouldn't. I think in a business situation, you've all you've either got to think, do you want the business or do you want to... That's the Do you yeah. want the business or do you want the other person to have it or do you sell it completely? Yeah. And I wanted to keep the business. Yeah. It was my idea. Yeah. Um, so you got through that period of time. Yeah, massive learning curve. Yeah. Massive. And now business entirely yourself? Entirely me. It's the people yeah. who work for me. Um, but it's my, I'm happy being captain of my ship, yeah. making the de decisions. Um, yeah. yeah. And the, the, you've mentioned that as like one big learning curve, which yeah. is, to be fair, is, has come up a couple of other times in this podcast with other people where they've had similar experiences right. where they've gone into partnership with other people. It's <laughs> being sat in this chair uh, and you sit there and you think like it's such a common thing it feels like it should be like one of the first thing if you're going to set up a company and you go onto company's house website and you're putting in a second shareholder it should flash up a warning yeah. have you got um, a shareholder agreement in place or a partnership agreement yeah. it's, it's that um that's good idea. hindsight is a wonderful thing yeah um what other sort of experiences or learning experiences may have sort of picked up on your um, journey? I think one of the things working for, I worked for Alan for six months, is considering his wealth, he's very, very modest. Yeah. And one of the lessons I took away from him was, he said, in business, ask yourself before you spend any money, because obviously it's coming from your profit line, do you really need it? And he was working on an Amstrad, an old Amstrad computer <laughs> at the time. <clears throat> so I am, I do run my business very leanly, and I survived yeah. COVID, whereas a lot of event companies have gone bust 
because literally the industry just came to a grinding halt because I don't spend money unnecessarily and I spend money wisely. I think entrepreneurs are typically very passionate people and very excited and it's very easy to get caught up with what I call the sexy stuff, the branding, the website, the logo, whereas I'm more interested in sort of like the nuts and bolts of the P&L. This is the toothpaste training. Yeah. Where's the money? Where's my return on investment? The cash flow. It's all yeah. about cash flow. You can have the best business in the world, but if you haven't got any cash in the bank, you're going to go bust. The, I've seen a statement you saying just that in the really? past, like managing the cash. Yeah, you've got to. Cash is king. Yeah. If you don't have any cash, you've got no business. That's so true about like looking after the money because you do see uh, when we see people in like within the community on UKBF and they're so focused on I need this, I need that, I need to look good, I need all my branding as you just mentioned, um, and quite often the fundamentals can get overlooked as to what do you really me- need. Yeah, exactly. You just need it for me. It's the nitty gritty. It's the it's the Oh, it's the boring part of a business, whereas I don't think it's boring because it is the P&L and it's the money and it's the cash. And yeah, I suppose I don't really, I, I've learned not to get carried away with the, the, the sexy side of things. For example, School Speakers website, it's probably quite basic, but my customers, teachers say they like it basic because it's easy to use. There's no advertising. So what I don't need to spend like another £10,000 having another website done because what I've got does the job um so i always think yeah alan used to say you think about this giant parrot on your shoulder saying do you need it do you need it any big spend i always think maybe like a week before i sign it off so i think do i really need it do i want it or do i need it yeah the i mean you touch on branding now we've if we was to use branding example if you had somebody else, like a branding expert or somebody like that, saying how important it is, there's got. Um, would you say there is a, an element of balance, perhaps, or like your personal branding, especially in today's social media world, where you I have think, to do a bit of that? Yeah, I think depending who you're speaking to, I think anybody who owns a branding agency, of course, is going to say <laughs> yeah. it's really important. And, yeah. you know, it's like a bottomless pit of money. You can use university students who often need um, sandwich work when they're having to have design course you know part of their course to do branding work really for my business how important is brand it's got to look professional it's got to look credible are is my customer a teacher going to make are they going to sit and look at my brand and think hmm shall i book a speaker or not based on her logo but then i suppose it's first impressions yeah and it's reputation and being in business for over sort of 10 years Branding is important, but it's not. People get so carried away with spending thousands of pounds on logos, PR teams, when actually probably the best person to do your PR is yourself. Um, you can build your own website. Social media is for free. Yeah. When you speak to, when you listen to a lot of successful entrepreneurs, they come from nothing and they are very um, astute with money in terms of they don't spend a lot. Yeah, and the reading into something what you just said there about your target audience being the teachers for example i'd probably extend on that and say it's knowing you who your audience are knowing who your clients are there might be certain you might be in a particular sector where you need to fit within that sector and have mm. the appropriate image and there might be uh, other sectors where it's not so important thinking back to like your L'Oreal days where a lot of my focus might be on branding there. One of the things, you know, we're in a platform, we have a podcast here. And when I was preparing for today, I read that you have an involvement in organizing Girls Out Loud. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading some of the content of how Girls Out Loud supports young people, it shocked me. And if you've done mine, wouldn't mind spending a bit of time just talking about that because I am very passionate about supporting young people. My particular areas are special needs um, and I've got some notes in front of me here but like for example now the I volunteer and coach uh, children that have been excluded from school 
uh, and support them. And here you're talking about 40 children kicked out of school every day. Um, when I read those stats, I mean, some of this I'm aware of, but I just want to say it out loud. It's such a shocking area. Um, 75% of permanent exclusions have special needs. Um, 63% of excluded children are likely to end up in prison. This is, you know, the, this means a lot to me. Yeah. Um, it obviously means a lot to you as well for you to mm. get involved um, in this organisation. Tell us a bit about it first. And the thing is, well, those figures are before COVID. So yeah. I would imagine now um, COVID's a completely different conversation, but I was talking to a group of educationalists yesterday that they feel that COVID is, uh, dis to say disruptive is under sell selling it, that I would imagine those figures have probably doubled since COVID. Yeah. The ch young people, oh, I'm sort of, from seven, we've got children who don't want to go to school from like seven upwards, so yeah. disengaged. I think all, you would, we would clump a lot of the, the trends under social mobility, which I'm involved in projects, so children in care. Yeah. If you're a child in care, you're likely to become a, um, have a child who will then go into care. You don't break any cycles. Um, involved in projects, the north versus the south. So yeah. two-thirds failing schools are in the north of England, and that number's becoming bigger and bigger. Um, girls versus boys. And it's really frustrating because when I started school speakers in 2009 and Girls Out Loud when it's been formed, uh, it, there isn't, the, the change isn't happening because you've got to change at grassroots. It's, you've got to be yeah. preventative. It's interesting that um, a lot of research has been done, the age of influence to break trends. But well, what age do you think, if you want to break a trend of, say, the, single parents? So the I don't know the exact um, I, well, look, there isn't an exact age, but um, my understanding is literally primary school age at yeah. that sort of like seven. Yeah. So Bradford, for example, near where I'm from, they're doing a lot of work at grassroots, going to primary schools um, around role models, particularly for the young girls about what they can do with their careers, because these figures are just going to go up and up and up. Yeah. It is something which it is frustrating, really frustrating. And the, so what you obviously involved in schools because through school speakers, what brought this to your attention? With Girls Out Loud. With yeah. the, I think because I'm a young woman and when Girls Out Loud was formed, I was sort of like late 20s and was, I think, comparing my own upbringing, which I've spoken about and yeah. looking at teenage girls who had no 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 role models no nothing no aspiration nothing to look up to nothing to strive for no motivation and i think for nowadays the pressure which teenagers are under is a completely different ball game to when you and i were teenagers that we just really want to do something specifically for girls and I mean, Girls Out Loud, it's, just, it's been such a success and the biggest success from it is the mentoring program called Big Sister. Yeah. So when we've been in schools and done like, one day activities, the girls say, it's great having Girls Out Loud in school, but what makes a difference to a student potentially going into uh, NEAT, neither, neither in education, employment or training, they could go on a Girls Out Loud Big Sister mentoring scheme for 12 months and it... The, pro, the first training which we did, none of those girls went into needs. Yeah. And so, what, how does that work? So Big Sister Mentoring Scheme is they get matched with the Big Sister because when we started Girls Out Loud and they started a mentoring programme, the, the, the students who were involved in it said they felt that the mentor was a bit like a big sister to them. Yeah. And they meet with them once a month for 12 months. They have contact with them. Well, they are, I suppose, like a bit of a big yeah. sister to really sort of like maximise their potential, keep them on the straight and narrow, give them some aspiration, give them some positivity, some motivation, and hopefully keep them out of need. That was the yeah. big goal. That's what head teachers will have a salary, but they get bonused on attendance, <coughs> how many students fall into need, um, how many students get excluded. So schools will really want to 
make sure that they don't have pupils going into the neat category. They don't want yeah. it. And and do you? It's, it, this is a leading question because of the area of working. When you talk about seventy eight percent of permanent exclusions being um, children with special needs, um, do you see any um, sort of lead into that or reason behind that? Yeah, I think there's been, I think over the last 10 years, a massive, a huge flip in secondary schools where in a typical state school, you'd have maybe 25% on um, special educational needs, whereas now 10 years later, that's more like 75%. Mm. And you, schools just do not have the resource. Um, mm. I know, I've worked with lots of schools where the teachers said that they feel that failing the students because they just have not got the resource to help those students and then in turn students can't cope with education, they can't work with the system, and then they end up being excluded, they go into a pupil referral unit, and then they're out of the system. Yeah. Um, if you had a magic wand, uh, what, would, what would you use it for? Uh, if I had a magic wand, I would trial a school, I'd have my own school, and I feel I'd have a completely different curriculum. I'd have to be a successful and happy in life curriculum. So for example, our Prime Minister recently saying that he wants all students to learn maths up to the age of 18. You know, let's try getting all students going to school first because not all students are going to school at the moment and um, that they actually enjoy school and having a curriculum which prepares them for life so they know about the nuts and bolts of life. So credit cards, what is a credit card, debit cards, um, relationships, the emotional side of life, um, the basics of, yes, we need core subjects. Controversially, do we really need to study history? Do mm. we really need to, to study RA? You know, topics like, I'd like a, a school which students want to come to, they enjoy learning, and they actually leave that school prepared, ready for life. The um, uh, We spoke earlier when I was talking about my daughter, so my children were homeschooled be because that enabled us to pick their curriculum mm. exactly along the lines of what you're referring to there. Um, completely agree. The There is so much focus in education on, on a, a checklist of subjects under the... I was going to say the word pretense, it's not a pretense, it's actually what they're targeted to do, mm. to provide a rounded education of a range of subjects where the, you can achieve so much more by focusing on what an individual's key um, aspirations are mm. and focus their education on what those aspirations are yeah. for them um, so that they can get on and do what they need to do with the education and knowledge they actually need. So teaching them about credit cards, mm. mortgages. If um, the my pa my feelings around um, the disruptive children that can often get excluded, that may have ADHD, uh, be on the autistic spectrum, ha or any you know whatever it might be, the are uh, the challenging minds. I'd love to have, you know, I'd, I'd welcome into my own business. Yeah. The ones that will turn around and just push the boundaries and ask, like, what, why, really? Mm. Um, and those who should be being taught about business and the being taught about, taught about how to start their own companies, some of the skills needed to run a company because that's most probably where they're going to have their strengths. Yeah. And often when I work in a school and they'll say, I've got the nightmare students, the disengaged, the naughty ones, they're really entrepreneurial yeah. and they're really good with ideas. I do feel that entrepreneurs' brains are wired differently, that yeah. you do think differently, behave differently, and they do have a short attention span. And yeah. you're sitting in a classroom all day with a curriculum, which is really boring. Yeah. It's, things are changing. Times are changing. I do feel that PHSCE, which is a one session a week, which gets shoehorned into the timetable, is probably one of the most important sessions where they're covering things like drugs, alcohol, lifestyle, sex ed, relationships. It should have more time accounted towards it. Yeah. But, 
I'm not the education minister. <laughs> no, no. Um, one last bit really that I sort of picked up on, um, and this is linked to social media, uh, which I thought was um, news for me to read. So, um, so depression in girls linked to high use of social media. Um, I can relate as I read that, and as I and this was sort of quoted from the Guardian on the website. And I look at you know I'm a father with a uh, was well, she twenty now, but my own daughter, and how much time she spent on social media throughout her teenage years. Mm. I witnessed the impact that had on her mental health. Um, that's quite shocking. Yeah, I see with my daughter who's ten. She's not on social media as such. She doesn't have TikTok, but she uses the internet. And I yeah. will say it's not real. This is yeah. it's just not real life. The filters. That's the thing that this is completely unrealistic benchmark and um abstracted life of tiny moments of people's weeks which <coughs> all look perfect and filtered and contoured and but i think what i feel that we're almost coming out the other end i think a lot of my friends older teenagers are really disillusioned with social media they're, they're not using it they're sort of completely disengaged with it um because I think they're realising it's not real. No. It's so boring. <laughs> it's so boring. When I yeah. see friends, kids, and I ask them what they're doing on a weekend, we do horse riding and football and activities. You know, sitting in your bedroom on your phone is not a hobby. Being no. on your phone for seven, eight hours a day is it's just toxic. No, it, it absolutely is. And uh, I am seeing that in my own daughter as her attitude to social media mm. has changed as she's grown hit her 20s and seeing it more of a tool for business now as opposed to anything else yeah. which is uh what it should be yeah really. when i explained social media instagram to eva that people put a post and they like and she said oh so what happens when you get so many likes i said nothing <laughs> said, right so you're pleasing people who in the wider world who you might not even know you're really worrying about people you don't know and she was like well that's crazy i said exactly yeah yeah. So the what's next for you? So twenty twenty three, um I am going to well the, the school speakers is um is just how it is, it's it's great. Um I'm working on a speaker mastermind group, so that's for speak people or speakers who are already speaking, who want to be a speaker, and we meet once a month. So I run that with a gentleman called David Heiner. That's something which I really enjoy doing. I've applied to become a magistrate. Right. Um, okay. Which I feel would be um, just something I've, I would like to do. And I've always had a burning desire to become an MP. But okay. the reality of being an MP um, doesn't... It's the practicalities of being a parent in the north of England. I don't live in London. I think I would struggle voting for some, going with a vote, which I don't feel comfortable with, you yeah. know, I mean, to be part of a crowd. I can't see you conforming to the whip too often. <laughs> no. So it's, it's things which, um, I suppose, pro projects, uh, deprived areas, we do a lot of work at School Speakers with um, so many different organisations about raising aspiration and um in deprived areas we, we do lots of that already but hoping to do more of it yeah. but yes i would like to become a magistrate yeah yeah i, I absolutely was not expecting the magistrate <laughs> you know, the, um, yeah. it's um aware of um some of the sort of um i'd say charity or voluntary work you do i could yeah. see like the angle towards the mp however i was if I'd agree. I think unless you go independent, the you're going to have, which is an upward struggle to nowhere. Yeah. Um, so then you're going into the major parties, and then you've got the I'm disillusioned by. I think the everybody is. Up, is. I think the country at the moment is there's. It's an exciting change, but we are in a period of change. Yeah. I saw an MP. I travelled with them on a train. Don't know them. Just got chatting. I was like. Just things like how come they spend so much time voting when we've lived in a virtual world where everything happened virtually. I always find it strange that MPs spend four days a week in Westminster, as I feel they should spend four days in their constituents area, yeah. in your community, doing your job, and then one day doing your paperwork and doing your voting. 
He yeah. think, feels all wrong to me, and he doesn't feel particularly efficient. No, no. And I like efficiency, but I'm a business owner, and we like efficiency. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, that's one one. And actually, w- when I travelled with that MP, if there was an advert for not to become an MP, they looked so tired that yeah, yeah I think they would do work very hard. Yeah, um, and it's a generally thankless task in many regards and you've always got the media spotlight on you ready to snipe you at any point no one's ever happy no nobody no. is ever happy being an MPC. So yeah definitely hopefully they are they really need um they want more magistrates under 50 they want more yeah. women i've also applied for the 50 50 politics trying to get more women into politics maybe not as an mp but some type of I don't know. Something, yeah. do you know? Yeah. yeah. No, as the uh, UKBF is all about business advice. Um, so you've had a couple of two experiences. So what I'd like, I'd normally say, give us three pieces of advice. Yeah. Um, I might make it, not I might, I'm going to <laughs> make it a little bit more complicated. Mm. From your experience on reality TV as The Apprentice. Yeah. Um, what three lessons could you take from that to apply to business? And then from your own experiences, if you uh, from running your own business, what you'd pick out from there, if, if different? Yeah, without a doubt, the, the first thing I took from The Apprentice is not to, not to think what, not to worry what people are thinking, but just, um, you just, you just give it a go because you haven't got yeah. time to mull things over, to doubt things and think, oh, this is, you just do it. You're just hammering the phones and you're on task and you're up against deadlines that when you come back into normal life and you haven't got a dossier of rules and you haven't got deadlines, but you realise that you could actually achieve so much in a short period of time. So it was the sort of, not the fear of rejection, just the sort of have a go attitude. Um, the apprentice, what are the lessons? You see, there's not that many I would take from the apprentice experience where I think I could put into having a business because nobody would want to work for you. Yeah. Did you, did you <laughs> I, I, if I rephrase that then, did you learn anything about yourself? I learned so much about myself. Yeah. I learned that I'm more patient than what I thought I would be. Yeah. Um, and also not to be really quick to judge people, but yeah. we're humans and we do judge people within three seconds that you've got to in in that experience you are on a task and you've got to work together as a team like a machine and you've really got to understand what every single person is good at to make sure mm-hmm. you put them in the right place so that you work together um and sometimes in that experience where it's really noisy you forget about the quiet ones yeah. and you've really got to be inclusive of everybody to make sure you get the best out of your team yeah do you um, side tra- well, actually sidetracking slightly before we move on to the business lessons? You was back in the boardroom so many times. What do you think the reason for that was? I was very vocal, so when yeah. other people learned to be quiet or they just didn't yeah. want to put the neck above the pulpit and sort of play it safe, that I would, if somebody was um, well, just lying, I would say, well, that actually didn't happen. It happened like this. I'd call people out on things yeah. and you need that because the producer said that they said, oh, she goes because you need to have that to have a TV show because if everyone sits there and yeah. is absolutely silent, we had one task where we went to Marrakesh and we came back in, we were all exhausted after doing the treasure hunt where you have to get the items and we were silent. You've got no TV show at that point. Yeah. So Alan Sugar said, I know what I'm going to do with you lot. And he went down the line and he started firing. He fired the first two people. <laughs> and then we all started talking really quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the lessons from that you'd share any, to anybody else from running your own business you take forward? I think uh, running a business is probably how I describe parenting. It's the best but the hardest job in the world. And I think running a business can... For me, I like the autonomy of running a business, freedom, not just necessarily on my diary and my time, but my ideas that I can have that freedom to execute things without having to 
put things through a process for a process for a meeting for a meeting um but to, the, to be realistic that results just don't happen overnight you've got to get your plan and then execute um and i've learned not to sort of dive off at the deep end and jump in i sort of get my ducks in a row now before i start swimming yeah uh, and then my last question for you then. So what gives you that drive every day to keep going? My drive every day is I've got every day I know I've got schools, colleges, universities, emails sat ready for me, phone calls. I mean, yesterday I must have had 10, 11 voicemails from schools wanting to book my speakers. And that's my drive to make yeah. it happen, to... I'm sort of like the Scylla Black of school speakers <laughs> that I match make the right speaker into the right school. And then when we get the feedback after, oh, wait, you've always got to speak to your customer. Then that's one thing that I've realised that a lot of people, I feel, don't love their customer. If you haven't got any customers, you've got no business. They are so important. And when we follow up after every event and say, how did it go? And you get the great feedback that the impact that those speakers have had, you think, yeah, it's good. That's yeah. what That's our cycle of work. So it's the you're get you're in that so you're having that satisfaction of every day yeah. of what you're doing. The legacy yeah. that hopefully that I just hope that when our speakers have gone in, we go on a whole range of subjects from mental health, resilience, addictions, everything at the moment. That 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 somebody thinks, yeah, I'm going to do that, or that's made sense, and you have that step change. So you just said the word legacy there, so I will ask. I'll ask. I'll, I'll pick up on that word then. So what? How? When when you're done, how would you want to be remembered? What would you want your legacy to be? I'd like somebody to take over my business and carry on growing it. The, I've got 600 speakers across the country. So when I map out over maybe 30 years how many events we've done, there'll be yeah. mil we've probably positively influenced millions of young people to hopefully have a more fulfilling life. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. And that's cool, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Yeah. Claire? It's been great chatting to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed watching this interview. Please remember to hit subscribe and like. It really helps us with the algorithms for YouTube. And I'll look forward to bringing you more interviews in the next episode of Drive, a small business podcast from UKBF.